Well, due to copyright laws, we're not able to put online the video that we just showed in the room, but it's a music video for the song Dear God by the rapper Dax. When my daughter, one of our daughters, showed me that song uh, a while ago, I thought that is exactly what we're talking about in this series. Now, before you go rushing out to watch or, or listen to that song, I do need to warn you that it is explicit in its lyrics, so I would encourage you not to, uh, to listen to it around children. I, and because of that, I can't recommend it for just pure entertainment value. But I do think it's a great launching point for our, our sermon series today. At the very, very beginning of the song, he says this, it's on the screens. I just want to make this clear. I am a believer, but sometimes it gets hard. My name is Dax. He then goes on to, to rap to God about all the questions he has uh, in life, questions about, about heaven and hell, the existence of God and not being able to hear God's voice, questions about evil, pain, and suffering, and the unspeakable things that, that people do to others, questions about how God's followers have, have treated other people throughout the years. They might be questions that you yourself are, are wrestling with. They're ones that we just can't ignore in the Christian faith. So the same way that Dax started his song, I think it's a perfect way for, for me to start this series and introduce myself to anyone who, who may not know who I am. I just want to make it clear that I'm a believer. I'm the lead pastor of this church. I'll be leading a series called Why I Struggle to Believe in God because sometimes it's really, really hard. And my name is Jeff Manis. No matter how you're joining us today, whether you are here in the room or watching us on video somewhere, thank you so much for being here. Our vision is to guide people to experience life to its fullest, connect into meaningful relationships, and make a lasting impact. And that's true for you online as much as it is for those here in the room. We want you to continue engaging with God, engaging your church, and engaging our vision by staying connected for as long as you have to uh, through our online services. If you've ever struggled to believe in God, uh, uh, if you ever had doubts or, or questions about faith or, or Christianity, I, I hope you know you're, you're not alone. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and my belief in God is not based on a lack of questions or doubts. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I still have questions. I still have doubts, but, but for me, my questions and my doubts have always led me back to God, always. Now, for you, your, your doubts may not lead you back to God, and regardless of what you believe, I, I hope you know we really, really do love you. We love it that you are here, even if you don't uh, ever agree exactly what we do about God. We, we love you, and, and here's where I'm coming from in this series. This is always in the back of my mind when I preach a sermon or talk to somebody about faith or about God. You might call it our big idea for today, but it really is for our whole series I can't prove to you that God exists. I can only bring you to a place where the two of you might meet. I, I can't prove that God exists. I, I wish I could, believe me, it'd make my job way easier as a pastor if I could just prove it. But I can't prove to you that God exists. No one can. But what I can do is bring all of us to a place where maybe you and God might meet. Or if you already believe in God, have a relationship with him, maybe I'll bring you to a place where, where your faith is deepened or you experience God in a, in a greater way, even with all of your doubts. Like, bring them with you. You see, our doubts don't have to drive us away from God. I think our questions and our doubts can actually deepen our faith in God. Timothy Keller, pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in, uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City and author of The Reason for God says this about doubts. A faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. 
Even Jesus' own disciples, uh, these men who lived with him for three full years, even they had doubts when he was standing in front of them just three days after he was brutally executed on a cross. Now standing there alive, the disciples doubted. Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, in in his eyewitness account of Jesus' life, Matthew 28, verse 17, he says this, When they, the disciples, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them, what? They doubted. These, These were the people that Jesus chose to start his church with. And they had doubts, and God wasn't afraid to share their doubts in his word to us. So in the series... We're going to look at some of the biggest questions and doubts people have about God. They aren't the only ones, but they're ones that we kind of see rising to the top as the biggest questions and doubts people have about God and the Christian faith. And I hope we're going to see how answers to these questions have helped me and countless other people believe in God even more. Today, to kick off our series, we're starting with this question. It's the big question for it today How can you believe in God when you can't prove he exists? How can you believe in God when you can't prove he exists? And by the way, that's a great question. It's it's one that we all need to wrestle with. Even as, as Christians, we must wrestle with this. I already admitted to you earlier, I can't prove God exists. But I would also add that you can't prove he doesn't exist either. So what do we do? Are we at an impasse? Do do, do we just stop right here? I mean, that would make for a very short sermon, which some folks wouldn't be too upset about. But I don't think that's the answer for us us to do. I don't think we should say, well, since we can't prove it either way to each his own, I, I would challenge me and all of us to to educate ourselves on the possibility of evidence either way, for or against God's existence. We all need to know why we believe what we do, based on evidence and education, not just a feeling. Our belief should be rooted in something logical, evidence. So there isn't proof that God exists, but I will submit there's plenty of evidence. I actually believe there is more evidence to believe in the existence of God than to not believe. I believe the evidence is overwhelming. And, and just a couple times in the service, I'm going to speak directly to the Christians in the room, to the Christians. We, we, can't, just, we can't just enter this conversation and say, well, it's in the Bible, Because to someone who doesn't believe, the fact that it's in the Bible is not evidence they don't believe in the Bible. So we need something else besides the Bible to try to prove our our belief, the existence of God. So if we believe, our belief should be a rational one based on evidence that our intellect and our faith can actually work together. Friends, I hope this encourages you. You don't have to check your brain at the door to believe in God. Both intellect and faith can work to, together. Because of that, because we can't just say it's in the Bible, this sermon will look a lot different than, than a, a normal sermon would for me. I'm actually not going to start with or even use much of the Bible at all in my defense of God. Also, we are merely touching, touching the very tip of the surface on this discussion. I I cut out pages and pages of notes and resources and study material that I would love to share with you. I just don't have time to. And and, and please, please understand, we are not suggesting in in any way over the next six weeks that that we are solving any of these questions in a 40-minute sermon when some people have devoted 40 years or more of their life to study, write, teach on, on on these perspectives, these different sides of the equation, both sides of it. So in these sermons, we're merely starting the conversation and then pointing you to further resources uh, in an in a effort to hopefully continue the conversation outside of here, even with other people. And then uh, lastly, before I get to some resources, I think it's important for us to acknowledge 
that for every point we make in this series in defense of God, there are very smart people who would make a counterpoint against it. And that's okay. That's okay. Like we should be able to have healthy conversations about things we, we disagree with, even the existence of God. If you're looking for some great resources to help you get a better foundation on questions like the ones we're answering, you should check out uh, these books that I have on the screen here. Take a picture of this if you want to. Um, all these books are available on Amazon. Some of them we have in the Element Store. I would, I've, I've read every one of these in preparation for the series, and I would highly recommend every one of them as well. The Problem of God, uh, Christianity for People Who Aren't Christians might be my favorite one because it's really written towards unchristian, non-Christian people. Confronting Christianity is similar to that one. Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, considered a Christian classic. And then The Reason for God by, by Timothy Keller. If you have read those books or you do read them, you're going to notice lots of things from those books show up into my, my sermons in this series. So how can you believe in God when you can't prove he exists? Are you ready? Three people. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> So here's what we need. I need you to put your thinking caps on and lean in because we go in deep today and through this whole series, we are going deep in every single message. Today, we are looking at a ton of information from people way smarter than me in a very, very short amount of time, starting with the philosopher Plato who said this, there are two things that lead men to believe in God. The existence of the soul, morality, and the order of the motion of the stars. Those two things lead people to believe in God, or what has come to be called today, the argument of universal morality and the argument of the universe. In apologetics, the study of, of faith, it's called those two things. Now, understand, before I dive in here, that since no one can prove that God exists and no one can prove he doesn't exist, both positions are faith positions. It takes faith to believe in God, and it takes faith to not believe in God. So if you don't believe, you can't say that you're not a person of faith. You are a person of faith. Your faith is just in the non-existence of God. Both require faith to believe. Okay? So why do I believe in God when I can't prove he exists? The first reason, coming from that statement from Plato, is this. Because of universal morality. Universal morality. Meaning, here we go. At its very basic level, universal morality is the inborn sense of right and wrong. And I'm not even talking about like the big right and wrongs. I'm not talking about like murder and bank robbery and rooting for the patriots. Not those things. It was heavy today, so I had to get something in there to make us laugh a little bit, right? I need some humor along the way, so I might interject a few things. So sorry about that, but we needed some humor. I'm not talking about big right and wrongs. I'm talking about just that inborn sense of right and wrong that starts showing up even when we're children. Things like, it's my turn to swing on the swing. You already had a turn. It's not right if you go again. Or, hey, that person cut in line. That drives me crazy, by the way. Does cutting in line not drive you crazy? Like if I'm at an amusement park and I'm waiting three hours to ride a three-minute ride, it's only right that everyone waits the full three hours. So if that person cuts in line, I'm calling them out in front of everybody. Can I get a witness today? It's, it's not right. You, you can't sit in that seat. I paid for that seat. It's not right. It's this, it's this inborn, hardwired into humanity, this inerrant sense of right and wrong. And this only gets magnified the bigger the issues get. Like if anyone hears the story of a child being sold into sex slavery or molested, a wife being abused by her husband, a theft, a murder, whatever it is, we bristle at those things, right? Right? We don't like it. Like inside of every human being is this inerrant moral code. And even when we personally don't follow that moral code ourselves, we, we feel it on the inside when we break it. We know when we've done something wrong. 
In fact, according to a study done by Oxford University, the largest study ever done on morals, on morality, they studied 60 different cultures, and they found in these 60 cultures that everyone everywhere shares seven moral rules. Everyone. I don't have time to go through all the rules. If you read those books, several of them talk about this study that was done. What they also found was every community, all cultures are held together by the same seven rules. How does that happen? Like, like how do we get there? Where did that moral code come from? And when did we all agree to it? I don't know about you, but I never voted on seven rules. I don't, I don't think you did. So where did they come from? Could it be? Could it? I'm not saying it is. Could it be they were placed there by God himself? Now, many people will logically push back on this and say, well, whatever each person believes for themselves is right for them. That's called moral relativism. It's a true, it's a real term and very smart. Even loving people believe it. But this belief structure breaks down very quickly. In fact, it, comes, it becomes personal real quickly. Because if everyone is their own judge of right and wrong, then you have no right to get angry when someone else does something you believe is wrong, even if that thing is done against you. Because they get to choose what's right and wrong, just like you get to choose what's right and wrong. So people, again, push back further, and they will say, well, they can believe and do what they want as long as it doesn't hurt others. But who decides what is hurting to others? Like, where does that come from? We all kind of have this general sense of what hurts someone and what doesn't. And some will push back then. This is kind of the last layer of, of this discussion. They'll push back even further and say, well, this, this internal moral law is actually not evidence of God. It's evidence of the byproduct of our evolutionary development and the social constructs in which we were raised. The problem with that is this. The evolutionary theory itself, at its very basic and raw level, is ultimately based on a survival of the fittest mentality. That the very basic level of evolutionary theory is only the strong survive. So it's kill or be killed, steal or be stolen from, oppress or be oppressed. That is the, the, the raw, basic evolutionary theory. Timothy Keller, who we quoted earlier, said this uh, about this evolutionary process. For evolutionary purposes, hostility to all people outside one's group should be widely considered moral and right behavior. Yet today, we believe that sacrificing time, money, emotion, and even life, especially for someone not of our kind or tribe, is right. So without a God that's behind the evolutionary process, which by the way, there are great Christian people who love Jesus and believe wholeheartedly in evolution. So let's say evolution is true. Without a God behind the evolutionary process, there is no compelling reason for loving your neighbor who looks different than you. There's no compelling reason to, uh, to care for the weak, the sick, the hurting, the marginalized, the oppressed. In fact, evolution says to get rid of them altogether. Things even atheists celebrate, like sacrifice, generosity, laying down your life for someone that you don't know. Every one of those things are counter-evolutionary. Charles Darwin, father of evolutionary thinking, in his own words, and I reiterate because what I'm about to say might sound offensive. It's not my, my words. His own words, Charles Darwin said this, unfavored races, the mentally challenged, those who have any potential to pass on any kind of sickness or disease should not be allowed to reproduce because they will hinder our progress as a species. He goes on to say this, both sexes ought to refrain from marriage if they are in any marked degree inferior in body and mind. Leave that on the screen for a second. Without a God behind it, 
That is the true result of evolutionary thinking. It's the true result. And even if, let's just say, evolution caused our morality, even if evolution is the thing that produces this moral code, why is it then that, that we are not evolving into a more morally pure society instead of a morally bankrupt one? Because everyone agrees we're not getting better as humans. Like the things we do to each other on this planet are despicable. And it's only getting worse. So if evolution gave it to us, we should have this, this rapid acceleration over time towards moral purity. But it's the opposite. Like, like true evolutionary theory without a God behind it, would only lead to racism, slavery, sexism, selfishness, and the unequal treatment of the poor, the sick, the marginalized, the oppressed, even wiping them out. Not only, it would not only do those things, we would celebrate those as right and good. But we are repulsed by that. Why? Why? Could it be? Again, I don't know. Could it be that something else has been hardwired into us by someone else? Like we have to deal with that question. We have to deal with it. I can't prove to you that God exists. Believe me, I wish I could. I can only bring you to a place where the two of you might meet. And one of those places is right at the intersection of our life and this universal morality that exists within us. That inside of us, something draws all of us to be better. Something draws all of us to be great. Something draws all of us. We have this innate de desire to be good, caring, loving, kind, compassionate, generous people. And even when we're not living that way, we are still pulled towards it. Where does that come from? For me, if there is no God, I believe that wouldn't exist. In fact, I would go deeper and say, I believe that couldn't exist if there was no God because we would all naturally only look out for ourselves and celebrate others who succeed at living that way. But we don't do that. We don't do that. So how can I believe in God when I can't prove he exists? Well, one of the many reasons is because of universal morality. Everyone good so far? We all still good? I was going to ask you, should I, I'm going to, you know, do you want me to keep on going? But I'm afraid of the answer. So we're going to keep on going. But that was point one only. It's about to get worse. Okay, point two is even deeper, and we're about to go scientific. So I apologize to the students in the room who thought you were getting a break from science for, for a day on Sunday. I agree with you. There should be no learning required on Sunday, but we're going to have to learn some science today. So here we go. The second most compelling reason for me is this, because of the universe, Simply because of the universe. Some people believe that faith, science, and education are at odds. They are incompatible. I actually believe that faith, science, and education are the perfect marriage. And there are plenty of, of world-renowned, brilliant scientists, philosophers, educators who agree with me. I don't have time to go through the list of Christian professors just at MIT, let alone the dozens of others, prestigious universities around the world. If you read those books, they mention literally dozens and dozens and dozens of Christian thinkers who are on the leading edge of science and philosophy. I'll give you two. Alvin Plantinga, considered one of the greatest philosophers alive today believes in God and is credited for making the belief in God academically acceptable in philosophy, which is huge. And then Francis Collins, physician at Bethesda, Maryland, who is also the director of the Human Genome Project, is a fully devoted follower of Christ and leads the Human Genome Project. But I only have time for that. We're diving into science, so, so here we go. That's for another discussion another day. Up until 1929... Atheist scientists believed the universe itself was proof that God didn't exist because the universe had always existed. That the only eternal thing they believed was the universe. Their own theory said that if something has a beginning, 
then something outside of that that pre-existed had to cause it to come into existence. But since the universe was eternal, there was no need for a God because it was the only all-existing, ever-existing thing. But in 1929, that changed when Edward Hubble made a discovery that the universe itself had a place where it began. It began to exist at a certain point in time. When Hubble looked through his telescope, he discovered that galaxies were moving away from each other at a rapid rate, and the universe was continuing to expand. Further study concluded that these galaxies were moving apart so rapidly because at one point they were flung apart by a massive explosion or a force of some kind. We've come to know this as what? Big Bang. Thank you. Like, it's like, holy buckets. We, it's the Big Bang Theory, okay? What we know it as. But, but, again, not saying this, could that force have been God? Could it have been? Did you know that many of the first people to reject Hubble's theory were not Christians? But atheist scientists, they push back. Because if his discovery was true, there was now evidence that the universe had a beginning. Which means, according to their own theory, something or someone that pre-existed outside of it had to cause it to come into existence. In addition to this... The, the, to the beginning point of the universe, it was also discovered after Hubble discovered this Big Bang theory that the energy of the universe was gradually decreasing, like a battery running out of power. So if the universe were eternal, having no beginning, then it could not be running out of energy. Scientifically speaking, something does not wind down unless it's been wound up to start with. That's why toddlers crash at some point in the evening, praise the Lord Jesus, because they've been wound up, and now it's time to wind down, because mom and dad need some sleep. Can I get an amen? And listen, I know I'm about to open up a can of worms that I probably shouldn't, and some Christians won't like me saying this, but it's true, so here we go. As Christians... We don't have to push back against the Big Bang Theory. We can actually embrace it. Everyone still okay? Like that's almost more controversial than any political thing I've said in the last five weeks. I'm not saying that right now I embrace it. I'm just saying you can love Jesus and embrace the Big Bang Theory. We need to remember, Christians, that the first couple ja chapters of Genesis are not a science textbook. They don't tell us how God made the heavens and the earth, just that he made them. Like the point of Genesis was never to teach us science. It was to reveal the God behind the science. The very first verse of all the Bible, Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It, the Bible never tries to prove God. The Bible just assumes that God exists and then declares that he created the universe. So did God use a big bang billions and billions of years ago? Or did he create the world in six days, about 6,000 years ago? To me, both those things are the wrong question to ask. And Christians in the room, that is the wrong place to be wasting our breath in trying to convince people. We get so laser focused in our American evangelical Christianity in trying to prove to everyone else in a literal six day creation. But the question to ask is not when he did it or how he did it, but who did it? Was it God? We have to answer that question. We have to. Nearly everyone in the scientific community agrees that the universe exists from something outside of physics that we know of or at least have ever experienced in recorded human history. There's no other experience in recorded human history of something exploding and creating what, anything like what we see today. Many different theories have been presented outside of the Big Bang Theory, including, believe it or not, the theory that aliens did it. For real. Like, talk about needing faith to believe in something. The Big Bang Theory, though, is widely accepted uh, to be 
the, the mode in which the universe came into existence. But even then, there's some explanation that needs done. Francis Collins, director of the Human Genome Project, believer, says this. He believes in the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang cries out for a divine explanation. It forces the conclusion that nature had a defined beginning. I cannot see how nature could have created itself. Only a supernatural force that is outside of time and space could have done that. And then the late world-renowned atheist scientist Stephen Hawking said this. The odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think there are religious implications. Hello. And by the way, they have figured out the odds. The odds of our universe coming into existence with our earth placed in the exact place it is, the only place they've ever discovered that can have human flourishing on it, the odds of that happening through a Big Bang random explosion are one in 10 to the 138th power. It's a number we cannot even comprehend. To put that into perspective, 10 to the 70th power is the number of atoms in the entire universe. And the odds of our universe existing out of a Big Bang, a random Big Bang without God behind it, are 1 in 10 to the 138th power. Further, astrophysicists will tell us that there are around 122 variables that have to be lined up in precise value at just the right time in order for the universe to come into existence randomly. And if any one of those 122 variables were off in the moment by even one part in a million millionth, matter would not be able to come together. No galaxies, no universe, no stars, no planets, no earth, no people. I just threw like a ton on you, but wait, there's more. It's like an infomercial. All that scientific data, all that does not then even include the evidence of design. Just the, the complexity of the human eye itself and the DNA of the human body, the intricate design of every single thing in the universe. In an NPR radio interview, National Public Radio, Owen Gingrich, who is the professor of astronomy at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. These dudes are so smart, I had to practice pronouncing where they work. <laughs> Owen Gingrich said this, there are so many wonderful details which, if they were changed only slightly, would make it impossible for us to be here. One has to feel somehow that there is a design in the universe and therefore a designer to have worked it out so magnificently. Professor of Astronomy at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I don't even know what that means. So, so let's get down on a level that... that that Jeff can understand, as someone else said, this was way easier for me to grasp, as someone else said, it's one thing to see a log jam like we have pictured here and wonder, was that built by a beaver or did it just happen? It's another thing altogether to look at the Hoover Dam and wonder, did that just happen randomly by an explosion or was there a designer and builder behind it? No one looks at the Hoover Dam and says, that just happened by accident. It is obvious there is a designer and a builder behind it. So why, when we look at the complexity of our universe, is it not obvious that there is a builder and a designer behind it? Even the Bible speaks to this. I know that some of you don't believe in the Bible, but I've waited a very long time to introduce any scripture, so I think you'll offer me some grace. I just wanted to show you that the Bible even talks about how, how the universe points us to God. Romans 1, 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul says this, they, meaning humanity, they know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. That literally our universe itself is screaming to humanity, there is a God! 
and a God who so intimately cares for you and created you, uniquely designed for a God-sized purpose. So you have universal morality, this internal written code of right and wrong. You simply have science and the universe, the design of it, the human eye and human DNA, the placement of the earth in what's called the Goldilocks zone, that if we were even remotely moved from where we are in the universe, we'd either freeze to death or burn up. Like it's the only place the earth can exist for human flourishing. You have stars, even the Big Bang Theory, not disproving God, but offering evidence of at least the possibility of a God as the force behind it. Friends, I would argue in light of of the limited evidence that I presented today and the so much more we haven't covered that it requires more faith to believe God doesn't exist than it does to believe he's real. It's a bigger leap to think that all of this and you and me are all just accidents, product of an accident. It's a bigger leap to believe that than to believe there's a loving, caring God behind it. So what do we do? What are our options? What are your options? You have two. Believe in God or don't. That's your only two options. And only you can make that choice. Only you can. I'm accountable for me. You're accountable for you. And and if you do believe in God, it won't take all your questions away. In fact, it's going to probably bring up more questions, ones like we'll see in the series like next week. Okay, God's real, but how can you believe in the Bible? How do you trust it? It's so old and outdated and written by people. We're gonna, it's a great question. We're going to have to address it in, in the faith. It doesn't remove all your doubts. probably creates more, and that's okay. It's totally okay. The, 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 the starting point is, do you believe? And one of the reasons, I think the main reason, so many people don't want to acknowledge that God created the universe is because if you acknowledge God created the universe, then there has to be a God. And if there's a God, I am morally accountable to him. And friends, I believe we are. I believe we are morally accountable to God. And even if you say, well, I now believe there is a God, our faith is so much more than just believing he exists. James, the brother of Jesus, writes this about our faith in his letter, James 2, 19. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. That Satan himself believes in God and it does him no good. Hebrews 11, verse 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So what do we do? What do we do? Like if there is a God, I want you to know what kind of God he is. And how do we know what kind of God he is? Enter Jesus. God who literally puts skin on. No other religion on the planet has a God who entered into creation, put on their flesh and bone, then died in their place, rose from the dead, and says, by faith in me alone, you can live forever with me. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other places, it says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the exact representation of who God is. You want to know who God is? You look at Jesus. That's who our God is. And Jesus, in in John 3, 16 and 17, maybe the most famous verse in all the Bible, he gives, I think, the most beautiful description of our God, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. No other religion has a God like that. And if I could end with you knowing one thing about my God, it's this, that God loves you. He loves you. And if I could say that to every single person individually, I would. My God, the God that I've given my life to, loves you. 
So what will you do with God? You can't prove he exists, and you can't prove he doesn't. So is there perhaps some evidence that points us to God? And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. If you want to have further conversation about this whole thing, we welcome that. You are free to question and doubt and wrestle and struggle and give us counterpoints. Find us on online. If you're watching online, call us, email us, talk to us after the service. Stop by the purple tent in the back when we're done. They'll, they'll not only pray for anything in your life, but they're willing to talk to you about God as well. And let me, let me end with this, and I've already I'm gone past my time, and you guys have been so good today. I want to speak one more time to the Christians in the room. If you are a Christian, you believe in God, and you want to know one of the easiest ways to be a witness for him. And I'm not just saying this because we're recruiting volunteers today. This is reality. One of the easiest nonverbal ways to show other people you believe in God is to serve his church. Serve his church. Because when you start giving an hour or two hours to your church, people will start to ask you, wait, you're doing what? You're giving time where? You say church. And then they say, why would you do that? And now you have them where you want them. Let me tell you why. Because my God put on skin, died in my place, forgave me of my sins. He rose from the dead. I put my faith in him, and now I will get to spend eternity with God. And it's not my church. It's not the pastor's church. It ain't nobody's church. It's God's church. So since my God did that for me, I can give an hour a week to him. So if you're a Christian... And you, and you are call Element Church your home, and you have yet to engage God's church through serving. I'm telling you, it's one of the easiest ways you can share your faith is simply by giving your time to his church. It's not mine, his church. Give your time to his church. Father in heaven, I have no more words to express my gratitude in you, Lord, and my gratitude to these wonderful people. They've been so patient today with me as I've rambled on and on. Lord, I pray that the, the words you gave me made sense coming out of my mouth, that they connected to our hearts. At the very, very least, Lord, I pray for every one of us, it would just cause us to pause and question, is there a God? And Lord, in that pause, I pray your Holy Spirit would do the work that we cannot do, that you would reach down into our hearts, our souls that you created, and draw every one of us to you. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Hope that was helpful. See you next week. You're dismissed.